Hey everybody, so in this video we're going to talk about the service brakes at the wheels. So we've already talked about uh, in the last two videos the subsystem breakdown, apply, uh, boost hydraulic systems as well as the master cylinders and how all that works. Let's talk about what happens when that fluid reaches the actual wheel brakes or service brakes. So I'm going to go ahead back here to screen share. So our service brakes, when I use that term service brake, remember we're talking about the hydraulic system um, in itself and it doesn't want to go to present. Present. Okay. And there we go. So we've got our service brakes. Uh, we've got two different types of braking assemblies. We've got our rotors, we've got our drums. So let's take a look at our wheel brake assemblies. So the disc brake design, which is what is our most modern in what most vehicles use, um, pretty much all modern vehicles are using this in the front. Um, we haven't used front drums since the 70s, so uh, and there's a reason for that. Crazy thing is, is the popular belief is disc brakes break better than drum brakes. Not the case. Um, mind blown. Disc brakes are, they have a few advantages. Disc brakes uh, are better at resisting what we call brake fade. I'll talk about that in a few slides. And they have less moving components to brake, um, B-R-E-A-K. And then also they are more consistent in their braking capabilities. However, they do require a little bit more force to be applied in order to apply them. So um, they don't have something called a duo servo or a self-energizing action that some drum brake designs have. So drum brakes actually are better at stopping the wheel from moving. The problem is that sometimes they stop it too good. Um, and so we get wheel lockup because braking is not about what brakes the best, what stops the vehicle best. Um, it's about how we do this consistently and safely without vehicle, vehicle, vehicle wheel lockup. Um, so our disc brake assembly looks like this. Many of you have seen this in pictures. Um, if I had my classroom back, I would be passing around uh, a rotor and a caliper to show you. But what we have here is. Um, I want to break some of this stuff down. So you see these studs coming off here. Those are what we call our lug studs or wheel studs. That is what your tire is going to slide up onto. Many German vehicles don't use studs. Instead, they use bolts that go from the wheel inward rather. Um, and on in this assembly here, we have something called a wheel hub. This hub carries a bearing inside that allows your wheel to freely spin with minimal friction. Now spinning along with the hub at wheel speed is going to be this round piece here called a brake rotor. Um, some people call it a disc. It's sort of that, uh, it, it's a um, sort of a cast iron steel material that, uh, and, and actually we can be looking at a couple different designs here. So um, I'm gonna pause this here for a moment. All right, sorry about that, folks. Having some technical difficulties here. Let's get try to see if we can get back. All right, cool. Um, all right, so we were talking about rotors. Um, there's a couple of different types of rotors. I'm not going to get into it. Um, I will just simply state that uh, there are different kinds, vented, non-vented, um, fixed, floating, and this is all uh, part of design, how they go on to the vehicle, if it includes the hub inside the rotor or not. Um, then we can start getting into things like slotted and drilled and all that fun stuff. Um, but we'll talk more about that when we get into a brakes class. All you need to know is that the rotor is spinning at wheel speed. And what we're trying to do when you step on the brake is stop that rotor to stop the wheel, right? So what does that is this caliper, and that's in blue in the picture here I've got. So the caliper sort of sits around this rotor, and when you step on the brake, what we're doing is we're squeezing the rotor to stop it. Now, if I just did metal to metal like that, the caliper is an expensive piece. Um, it, it can be quite expensive, actually. Um, and so if we wear down our caliper, we've got to replace that. And it would also wear down our rotor pretty, pretty fast. So what we do is we put a piece in between um, as sort of like a buffer and to act as a 
uh, wear point, a purposeful wear point. And those are our pads. So the pads, you can sort of only see really the end here. This is a bad picture because it says shoe. Disc brakes do not have shoes. They have pads. So don't embarrass yourself when you go into the local auto parts store and say, I need some shoes for my disc brakes or I need pads for my drum brakes. So we use pads. The pads are gonna go in between uh, our caliper and the rotor here and act as a layer to wear out. So that's why you have to change your pads so often um, rather than having to change out the caliper. Now the rotor is solid uh, metal, so it's, well, I don't wanna say solid, but it's, it's a, it, a stronger metal. So rotors tend to wear out slower than the pads do. Um, and we also have, have to have a certain surface finish on the rotor for it to work as a good brake as well. Again, all details we'll get into when you get into a brakes class next semester. So uh, what we're doing is uh, we're using hydraulic pressure to squeeze or to push out a piston rather inside of my caliper, which will end up squeezing my rotor. Let me see, I think I got a better picture here. Here we go. So we've got a rotor, and this is a different type of hub design on the rotor. Um, and here is our caliper. There's also different types of calipers. There's a type of caliper that actually moves and slides called a sliding caliper when you break. And there's another one where we actually have two uh, pistons essentially pressing it up against each other to squeeze the rotor. Um, I will definitely include videos in the Canvas module to um, show you what that action looks like on both so you, you can sort of get the idea. Again, more stuff we'll talk about when you get into a brakes class, but um, another picture I stole off the Googles here from rapperracer.com. Um, we've got our rotor that's spinning, here's our pads, and in this red here, we've got our caliper that is going to uh, these pistons inside. So you can see we've got, uh, this is a bleeder, but we're gonna have a hydraulic line going and feeding this rotor, or I'm sorry, this caliper rather. And it's going to put hydraulic pressure in this design on both sides, pushing pistons inward to squeeze the pads against the rotor. In other designs, we may just have one piston on one side um, and we end up sliding the caliper to squeeze the rotor. In a drum brake design, it's not quite so simple. We've got a lot more moving components here. So instead of pads, our wear component are shoes. And instead of being pushed inward to squeeze a rotor, we're using, instead of using a caliper, we're using a wheel cylinder, and that's this tiny little piece up here. Very similar to cylinder with tinier pistons. We don't need as much force in a drum brake, um, which is what I was mentioning earlier. So those wheel cylinder pistons are gonna move outward this time. And instead of using pads, we use shoes. So our shoes are much longer in design. And we've got one on the front side, one on the back side. Um, on top of all of this, we've got a drum. Now this drum you can see has holes for our lug studs. Um, the drum is going to be spinning at wheel speed very much like the rotor is. So we need to be able to stop the drum. And that's what our shoes are doing. So when the shoes get pushed outward, they're pushing up against the drum to provide friction to stop the drum. And that's what this is all about, it's friction. If I can't build friction, I can't stop. So we utilize the fact that two moving components are moving against each other. And we're utilizing the surface finish, the surface material uh, to create a friction, which is gonna turn into heat. So we're gonna try to change our energy uh, from a kinetic energy into a heat energy. Um, and so that's, uh, that's how all of our brakes work. But for, for drums, we're using a wheel cylinder to push out against shoes to press out against the drum. Now, once you've let off the brake in a drum brake design, um, in a disc brake design, we use a, a rubber seal, it's called square cut seal, that sort of springs out when you press on the brake and pulls it back in when you let off and there's no hydraulic pressure. Um, we'll get into this again when you get into a brakes class, I will get into way more detail. Um, but for a principal's class, this is the level I think we'll stay at. In a drum brake design, we don't have any rubber seals that pull our wheel cylinder back to pull the shoes back, especially because the shoes are so big. We need springs to return the shoes once you're done letting off of the brake. And those are our return springs. Now, down here in the picture, we've got a self adjuster uh, or a star wheel adjuster. This can also be put up toward the top depending on the design. Um, but as our shoes wear out, 
the shoes need to be pressed out further and further against the drum. And so they do need adjustment periodically. Luckily with disc brakes, disc brakes self-adjust and it has to do with that square cut seal. Drum brakes do not self-adjust in the same way. They use a star wheel adjuster uh, that will eventually walk its way out to push the shoes out. Um, there's different ways to adjust those. Sometimes you adjust them every time you go in reverse. They self-adjust in different manners depending on manufacturer. Um, but that's how a drum brake in a nutshell works. Generally, again, we see drum brakes on the back of vehicles on cheaper models for, for economical uh, compact cars. And then we do see them in the back on uh, trucks and SUVs from time to time as well. Then is our, oh, let me move my screen out of your way here. Then comes our parking brake. The parking brake is meant to, again, not to stop the vehicle, but to keep it in place after it's already been stopped. That's its design. Now, obviously it can be used in, as an emergency brake, but that's not its design. And we've already talked about how they are mechanically operated. Luckily, I've kind of already covered a lot of this stuff. In the picture here, we've got our center handbrake. Um, most of the time, um, we're gonna have some sort of adjustment mechanism in here. In this design, it'll probably be right next to the handbrake. Um, it may be elsewhere in other places because that cable uh, stretches from time to time. Now, how do you tell if your parking brake is adjusted properly? So what I would recommend is going on a hill and trying to put your car in neutral. Um, you are going to apply the parking brake. Now, if it's, it's easier to gauge if it's the kind that clicks, <laughs> um, but engage your parking brake enough to hold the vehicle. Uh, hopefully if it can, be ready with your foot on uh, above the service brake just in case it can. If it's a type that clicks, you should be in between two to seven clicks before it will actually stop the vehicle. If it's less than two, it needs to be adjusted, it's too tight, and it may be causing dragging, causing other issues with your brakes. If it doesn't, and maybe it, say it takes more than seven clicks, maybe it takes 10, 15 clicks, you may need to adjust it because the cable does stretch and it loosens up over time to put it back within specification. If it is not the design that clicks, you just apply the parking brake as much as you can. And if it keeps the vehicle stopped, then you should be good. FMVSS really only has, it um, says that it has to stay stopped for five minutes, I believe. It's kind of crazy. Obviously manufacturers want it to stay stopped uh, indefinitely, that way they don't get sued. But uh, your parking brake may need adjustment if you apply it and it still wants to slide back. So just keep that in mind. Um, and that's how you maybe would check that. So apply your parking brake on a hill. If it stops the vehicle, then you should be good. If it does not stop the vehicle, it needs to be a, either adjusted or components need to be looked at to see if it's in good working order. Now, brake balance control, I talked about this a little bit in the uh, uh, earlier in one of the past videos here. Um, we've got our, uh, we've got two valves that are for balance control. Now, I already talked about our brake light warning switch. Um, I don't think this one's got it. It, it just shows a combo valve here. Um, we are gonna have some sort of what we call a pressure differential switch that has a little, uh, piston or pintle in the middle and if we lose pressure in one of the systems now we can talk about this because now we talked about split systems here we can see this is uh, we've got uh, one system coming out this way and one system coming out this way this looks like a conventional split or it is a conventional split system so if I lose my rear pressure this little sensor inside is going to move in one direction grounding out the light and we'll put on your red brake warning light letting you know you've lost pressure in one system. So um, that is your pressure differential switch. A metering valve, we'll get more into this stuff when we get into an actual brakes class, but your metering valve is actually going to delay your front brakes. Sort of crazy. And you're only needing a metering valve if you have rear drums. If you have all four discs, there's no need for a metering valve. 
What the metering valve does essentially is it delays the front brakes, giving your rear brakes a chance to engage because shoes and drum brakes have, uh, well, drum brakes have more moving components and it takes longer to engage them. And if I engage my front disc and my rear drums at exactly the same time, my front disc will engage first, creating a nose dive. So if I've got a vehicle that has a problem, every time I brake, it sort of really wants to transfer all that weight to the front. That's probably a metering valve issue uh, or a, some other hydraulic issue um, keeping the rear brakes from applying. But that's a metering valve in a nutshell. The proportioning valve is simply going to limit the pressure going to your rear. So we don't want to apply equal pressure to my fronts and my rears. And this has to do with the amount of braking being uh, applied. Remember we mentioned that 70% of our braking is done up front while 30% roughly is done in the rear. Well, then that means I need to, uh, I, I need to moderate how much brake pressure is going to my front versus my rear based upon that. If I put too much brake pressure in my rear, let's say I do uh, the same pressure in the front as the rear, my rears will lock up most of the time and, and that's what we don't want. So we're gonna limit the amount of rear pressure so we don't get rear wheel lockup and that we have ample amount of pressure in our front um, as well as the rear and that's what our proportioning valve does. Um, a lot of the times we'll take all three of these or two of these and put them all together in one. So in the picture on the right, it shows a combination valve. A combination valve is usually your proportioning valve and your metering valve if you have one, again, only for rear drums and possibly your pressure differential switch sometimes. But if it's called a combo valve, it can be any variation um, as long as it's two or more. Um, it can be called a combination valve. So, um, that is our brake balance control from, from front to rear. Brake warning lights, there are uh, around three reasons for your red brake warning light to come on. So first and foremost, your red brake warning light should not be on. Um, the color red means like, hey, there's something wrong here. And uh, it can be turned on for a couple of things. First reason, obviously, is your parking brake. Now, a lot of modern vehicles actually have a separate uh, parking brake light to tell you that the parking brake's on, so there's no confusion, but that, that is a possibility on some vehicles. Another reason would be hydraulic failure, as I just mentioned with the pressure differential valve. Another reason, and there's actually four reasons. So the third reason would be uh, low brake fluid. So if we go back, well, or I might go forward here, uh, or I might go backward. Uh, I need a picture of a brake master cylinder. Here we go. Right here, we've got a brake fluid level sensor. That sensor is detecting the fluid level inside of the reservoir to make sure that we have enough fluid. Your whole brake system, the service brakes, work on hydraulic principle. That means if I don't have fluid or enough fluid and I get air in the system, we don't have brakes because air can compress while fluid cannot. So air will not transfer the force down to the wheel brakes the same as fluid with no air. And so we need to be within that minimum and that maximum line at least. If I don't have enough brake fluid, my brake fluid level sensor is going to create a signal to turn on my red brake warning light as well. So any of those three reasons could be the case. Now, I did mention that there could be a fourth, I'm trying to go back here, a fourth could be an electrical fault in any of those components. So if I have a short to ground, or uh, when I say short, it's, it's actually not bypassing the, the light bulb, it's actually gonna bypass the sensor. But if I have a short somewhere shorting the sensor, um, that will create a ground to turn on your red brake warning light. Um, that, that could also be the case. So it's either going to be the parking brake, hydraulic, uh, hydraulic failure, low brake fluid, or an electrical fault in either of those sensors. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and that's the sensor for your parking brake, the sensor for your pressure differential, or, or the pressure differential switch slash sensor, also the, the brake fluid level sensor. So that would be how you go about diagnosing or starting to diagnose a brake, a brake light warning light is simply by knowing what can turn it on. 
And if you know your parking brake is off, you checked your fluid level, and you know when you press on the brake pedal and by looking up there's no leaks, you don't have a hydraulic fault, then you know that there's an electrical fault somewhere. Maybe one of the sensors is bad or you have a, a wiring issue. The other light is an amber light. Now, amber usually means like, hey, this is a warning. You should do something about it at some point in time, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to pull over to the side of the road. And that is your ABS light. I haven't talked about ABS light, but ABS or, or ABS in general. ABS is your anti-lock braking system. If you see an amber ABS light, that means that your ABS system or your anti-lock braking system is not functioning due to a fault somewhere in the system, whether it be a sensor or a module or a wiring issue. Um, so if you see this light, it means you don't have anti-lock uh, service and you could end up with wheel lockup if, you, if you're an emergency stop. So just keep that in mind. It means that there's a fault. Now, if you do see this light on, there will be a code associated with it within the module that you could look up to try to pinpoint where the problem might be. Now, aside from that is break, not brake warning lights, but brake lights. Uh, by law, you gotta have three of them. So anytime uh, as a technician, a vehicle comes into your shop, you need to look at your brake lights or your customer's brake lights. Uh, make sure that both the right, left, and your third brake light work. The third could be somewhere inside the uh, vehicle like this here, or it may be located in a spoiler or a wing. Um, but Nobody usually knows when their brake lights go bad because uh, you have to be stepping on the pedal in order to get the lights to turn on. So it's always a two person deal uh, with that. So uh, most customers don't know. So any vehicle that comes in your shop, this should be part of your inspection. Um, and, and it will be if, if you find yourself finding a job in this field, you'll, you'll get used to it. So every vehicle you look at, you'll just out, right brake light out, third brake light out, left brake light out. Um, so, We'll get into this in a brakes class where we'll actually test the sensor and try to figure out, you know, voltages and things going out to the brake light. So, so at least you have a basic idea of how these systems work along with your brake pedal and the brake switch, the brake light switch. Brake fluid itself um, is enough to talk about. I just want to briefly discuss things. I get way more into this in a brakes class, um, but most vehicles call for dot three brake fluid. Dot three brake fluid is very similar to dot four and dot 5.1. In fact, they are all three the same base. It's something called a, uh, or a chemical called a polyglycol fluid or a polyglycol based fluid. Um, Polyglycol-based fluid, like I said, 3, 4, and 5.1 are yellow in color. Um, there's actually a couple of things I'd like to talk about. So let me actually stop screen sharing here. Um, so polyglycol fluid um, have similar, or they have a, a particular characteristics. First characteristics is that they're yellow, or amber in color. And when I say that, we're talking a very light color. Brand new brake fluid is almost clear, um, but it has a hue of yellow or amber. Another characteristic is that it is bad for paint. If brake fluid gets on any painted surface, a fender, inside the engine bay, anywhere, within 10 minutes it'll start to eat the clear coat. And if you leave it there long enough, you'll eat it straight to the bare metal. It destroys painted surfaces. So be very, very careful um, if you're dabbling in any of that stuff, you're doing brake flushes, you're changing a master cylinder, you should be using some sort of fender cover on the vehicle um, so you don't damage that surface. Also, um, another characteristic and, and what will help we sort of from this one and the next, if you get this on painted surfaces at all, it's not the end of the world. You can wash it off with just water and you'll be just fine. Um, what you don't want to do is get water into the brake fluid in the reservoir, so be careful of that, but you can use water to wash the fluid down. Now, what's related to that topic is polyglycol-based fluid also um, is, we'll say, um, uh, Sorry, it has an um, affinity for water. Uh, it's what we call hydroscopic, meaning that it likes 
water. Uh, in fact, it absorbs water. Water will actually blend in with the fluid um, and you can't even see it. The problem and, and, and the reason why we don't want this is because the fluid needs to have a high boiling point because we're talking a lot of friction, a lot of heat, and that heat's gonna get transferred into the brake lines, into the fluid. If that fluid boils, what happens to any fluid that boils? Bloop, 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 bloop. It aerates and we get air in the fluid. Problem I just mentioned a few slides ago is if we get air in the fluid, then that air can squeeze and compress. So when I step on the brake pedal, before I actually get anything down at the service brakes, I have to compress that air until it can't anymore, and then it will move fluid down to, fluid pressure down to the service brakes or the wheel brakes. And so that's a, that's a big problem. Um, we, there's actually a word for that, that's actually hydraulic, uh, hydraulic fade when our fluid boils. And the only reason we really get that problem besides racing in any customer vehicles is because the fluid has absorbed too much water. There's a number of reasons this can happen. Either contamination from the technician who was doing a flush um, or working on the system, or if somebody leaves the brake fluid cap off for too long, if I take a, a container of brake fluid, this is not brake fluid, water, but if I take a container of brake fluid and I sit it with the cap off overnight on a workbench, the next morning it has absorbed enough water to become trash and dangerous to put in the system. That's how easily this fluid absorbs water, uh, even through the atmosphere. It, it loves water. And the problem with water is it lowers the boiling point. So this fluid has a high boiling point. Water's got a boiling, a boiling point uh, that is much lower, and so the more water we add to it, we dilute it, and we lower our fluid's boiling point. So any polyglycol dot three, dot four, and dot five point one fluid is hydro or hydroscopic, meaning that you need to keep it sealed if at all possible, whenever possible. So if you're checking brake fluid, take the cap off, put that sucker back on. Don't leave it off unless you have to because you're doing a flush or whatnot. Um, so just keep that in mind, which is why I mentioned um, when you're rinsing stuff off, maybe got fluid on it, don't get the water inside the brake fluid. Uh, just keep that in mind. So um, that's a big deal on your polyglycol fluid. Um, but besides that, uh, and, and because of this, it has a service life of about two years. So 3.3, 3, 4, and 5.1, after two years, even if it's sealed in the system, um, it's not perfectly airtight. After two years, brake fluid, even if it's perfectly clean, will have absorbed enough water for the boiling point to become dangerously low. So brake fluid, no matter the mileage, uh, should really be serviced every two years if it is a dot three, four, or 5.1 polyglycol-based fluid. So just FYI, that is part of service. Also, while we're talking about this, um, this is something I saw in the field. Customers will go 10 years without a brake flush and you pop the cap open and it looks like a thick dark chocolate milkshake inside of there. Um, it, it, it's just black and thick or like thick black coffee. I don't know, whatever, tar. It, it looks bad and you're like, man, this thing needs a flush like years ago. If you do that, the master cylinder may be trash after you flush because the gunk in the fluid might be what's holding it together. So just keep that in mind. Um, if, if you're dealing with that at a shop, maybe you just started working, you, you haven't seen this trend yet, um, always let the customer know like, hey, the fluid's in such bad condition, if I do a flush, I might, uh, the master cylinder may give out. So if a customer knows that, then they can say, okay, well, if it happens, I'll pay for it. So just communicate with your customer. Um, that customers want communication. When you go to the doctor, when you go to the dentist, you go to people who you're trusting their, their, their knowledge, you want communication. You want them to tell you what's going on so you, you can be a part of, of the process to understand what, why they may need to be prepared to buy another part um, if it goes out. So anyways, neither here nor there. We'll talk more about that when you get into a breaks class. But this fluid does have a two-year uh, service life, um, so just keep that in mind. So that's a polyglycol-based fluid. Um, the other type of fluid, and while I'm here, I might as well talk about it. Um, dot three, four, and five point one fluid. Some of you guys might be thinking, well, what's the difference between them? Why are there different numbers? 
Dot three, dot four, and dot five point one, those numbers are referring to the boiling point generally. At least that's how it started. So dot three is gonna have the lowest boiling point. But if you're an everyday driver just to and from your, your work or whatnot, and you don't really do a whole lot of performance type stuff, you don't really need anything more than dot three. Dot three does just fine. Uh, dot four would be the next step up. Uh, a lot of motorcycles. So uh, when it comes to cars, dot three is the most common recommended by OEMs. Um, motorcycles, most common is gonna be dot four. And this has to do with the amount of heat generated and, and things like that. Um, but that is a higher boiling point. Dot 5.1 was gonna be the highest. This is more of like racing brake fluid. It's going to be for a performance application um, where your brakes are gonna be getting quite a bit hotter and fluid is gonna be, or heat's gonna be transferred to that fluid uh, quite a bit more. So that is, it's really more of a heat range or boiling point range. So moving from polyglycol, the next one down would be uh, dot five, so just regular old dot five. Dot five is what we call a silicone base. Silicone, I'm pretty sure it's both right. Um, <laughs> Silicone based fluid is actually purple. It's a really cool looking purple too. Um, fluid. Now, the reason dot five came out was that it had a higher boiling point. Um, and so you'd think it'd be for racing and all that, but dot five's best quality is it's not bad for paint. You can leave it on there all day and it's not gonna do anything. So the most common uh, reason people may switch, OEMs don't use DOT5, which by the way, some OEM manufacturers for motorcycles may use DOT5, or I think Harley did actually for a little while. Um, I'm sure there's more, but that's just the one that comes to mind right now. DOT5 fluid is, is best quality is it that it doesn't damage paint. So if you spring a leak from a master cylinder or a hydraulic line, it's not gonna hurt paint. If I paid $45,000 for a paint job, I don't want to risk destroying part of that because of my brake fluid. And so a lot of uh, a lot of high dollar custom painted low riders and, and uh, custom um, uh, like hot rod type stuff or restorations when we're talking really, really high dollar custom paint jobs, they may switch to dot five for that reason. So we know it does have a high boiling point. Uh, we know that it doesn't hurt paint. However, uh, it does have a weak point and actually it's a couple weak points. One of the weak points is, is that it has, and I'm using the same term, and it, it's not really in the same fashion, but just for the lack of a better term, it has an affinity for air, and we know that we don't like air, right? So the problem with dot five is that it is hard to bleed of air sometimes, it can be a real pain in the butt, because it does, and, and it doesn't absorb air like in the sense I just talked about uh, dot three uh, polyglycol with water. The reason why it holds on to air more is because it's actually a thicker viscosity than your other brake fluids. And this is the exact reason why we don't use dot five in racing very often. We don't use dot five in racing because it's thicker in viscosity, meaning uh, its consistency is thicker than polyglycol fluid. Why is that a problem? You, and, and we're talking very minute amounts, but it actually changes your brake reaction when the fluid is thicker. And so for racing applications, we may not want to use DOT5 because we need that reaction time um, where maybe if, if I've got a trailer queen with a custom paint job, that's not a really big issue for me. But if I'm a NASCAR driver, um, that's a big issue for me, right? So uh, most of the time we don't see dot five in racing for that reason. It is is because it, it has a thicker viscosity, um, and that thicker viscosity allows or or allows the affinity for air to sort of happen. So it tends to hold on to air pockets like honey would rather than water, right? Water would release air pockets faster than say honey, and and that's a, obviously a gross exaggeration, but that's part of the reason why it has such an affinity for air. Um, so that is our uh, dot five silicone uh, based brake fluid. Now there is one more um, and I, there's not, uh, I, I've got a picture. So I'm going to go back to my screen share here. Um, 
So here's our dot three, four, five point one fluid. Here's our dot five fluid. Again, we don't use this in OEMs. Um, there's a couple of other features. I, I don't want to get too into it because this is more of brakes class stuff, but uh, polyglycol fluid has a tendency to swell seals. So you actually get less, um, you are less prone to leaks with polyglycol fluid. However, if you do burst a leak, it will destroy paint. Dot five is more prone to leaks because it doesn't have those seal softening capabilities. Same with HSMO, um, which is what I'll talk about right now. Um, but HSMO or hydraulic system mineral oil is going to, instead of a silicone or a polyglycol base, it's going to be a petroleum base. And yes, it's similar to say like oil or transmission fluid. It is bright green, like Hulk green in color. It looks really, really cool. It has a super high boiling point. Um, it doesn't hurt paint, so that's kind of nice. Uh, some high-end vehicle manufacturers, like I believe, uh, let me see, it's either Bentley or Rolls-Royce. I know Audi may have used it on a couple models, um, but some higher-end vehicles may call for HSMO um, from the factory. Uh, so there is that. Again, this one is, uh, it's gonna have a different viscosity, but it's also not going to damage paint, and it's also not going to uh, have an affinity for air the same as a silicone brake fluid is. So it's a very, it's probably the most expensive. So if we were to put a dollar sign on it, HSMO would be the highest, uh, dot five would be the next highest, and then uh, below that would be dot 5.1, and then four, and then three would be the cheapest. So that's brake fluid for you. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about brake fade. Um, Brake fade, and I, I don't want to get too into this. That's why I didn't put a lot of information here on the PowerPoint. I do want to talk about it, though, so you're familiar with the terms when you get into a brakes class. Brake fade is referring to our brakes not working anymore. Um, it's referring to the brakes just, they cut out for whatever reason. Um, there is about five reasons why your brakes don't work. Um, well, and, and I say that, as you're driving, if your brakes stop working, these would be why, besides some sort of mechanical malfunction. We can have water fade, which is common when we get flooding, lots of rain and water going on. Uh, water will create a barrier between my pad or shoe and my disc or drum, and um, it will keep friction from happening. And so you go to press on the brake and you have no brakes. And that's, uh, that's a, a, pretty much your instant karma for tsunamiing somebody or going through like some serious amounts of water very quickly. As soon as you press on the brake, um, you, you may not have brakes and that's what we call water fade. Hydraulic fade is what I was talking about earlier where the fluid boils. So if my fluid boils, um, I get air pockets and I'm gonna get a really spongy brake pedal. And then we're not gonna have our brakes work near as good, if at all. Um, if you saw Ford versus Ferrari, uh, he actually kept having this issue when they were um, trying to build up the GT in the end, I think it ended up killing um, uh, the, the driver. So um, that, but that's hydraulic fate. That could have been, I don't know if they were, uh, dealing with that or if they were referring to a gas fade, but he was having a brake fade issue because the brakes were getting too hot. So water is because of water coming in. Hydraulic fade means the fluid got too hot. Lining fade means the lining got too hot. So that could have been the case as well. If I have a brake pad, let's say a uh, good old fashioned Duralast, may have a limit for temperature. And once it get past that certain limit, we lose what we call a coefficient of friction. So we're not able to build up the friction like we were before, and that is lining fade. Again, we'll talk more about this when you get into a brakes class. Gas fade is where my, and this, we don't really get gas fade anymore, um, but gas fade is going to have to do with uh, a type of pad being used called a, a bonded pad or mold bonded pad. And we used to use a backing plate with the pad material on top of it. And I'm, I know I'm getting into some subjects that might be a little bit too uh, advanced for this, this uh, principle maybe level. Um, but just for those of you who are on board with me, all your brake pads have a metal backing to hold it in place inside the caliper. And then we have a wear material that's meant to wear out, right? Well, we used to use glue to hold those materials together, and we still do, but this type of glue that we used to use when it got to a certain temperature would actually create a gas, and we call it gassing. Uh, 
And that gas would actually then, on the other side of the pad, get in between the pad and the rotor, creating a barrier, keeping us from building friction. And that was gas fade. We don't get gas fade anymore because we don't use that same glue that caused that. Um, but we still, uh, we still have rotors. Uh, that are designed as if we do. So cross-drilled rotors, they're not for cooling in that sense. Cross-drilled rotors are for gas fade and water fade. That's what they're for, same with slotting. Um, it's, it, it will get more into a brakes class when, when we, or, or we'll get more into that when we get into a brakes class, but they are not for cooling despite what you might have heard anywhere else. Um, there's a couple different theories on things. I don't wanna get into it um, because again, this is a principles class. But even though you do increase a surface area, you're also decreasing the mass, um, keeping it from dissipating heat. So they don't really level out. Um, anyways, crash shield rotors are not for cooling, same as slotting. They're actually for water fade and gas fade, but we don't really get gas fade anymore. But you know what, they look cool. And uh, there's actually a lot of benefits to slotting. Um, neither here nor there. Let's move on to mechanical fade. The mechanical fade, our last one, is actually only going to apply to one style of brake. The rest can apply to any kind of brake, but mechanical fade can only apply to drum brakes. And what happens with mechanical fade is as my shoes push out against the drum, the drum expands from heat because it's soft and malleable from the heat. And now I have a brake pedal that continues to go down because the shoes are actually pushing the drum out and uh, are, are not making the same amount of contact or pressure with the drum as it should. And so I'm gonna lose braking from that. So that's brake fade. I think we've got one more slide here. Uh, here we go. Anti-lock braking, here's your ABS. ABS is not anti-braking. Um, when I taught high school, that's what uh, I used to get all the time. ABS is anti-braking system. No, that would not serve a purpose. <laughs> anti-lock braking systems, however, serve uh, quite a good purpose, as well as traction control. Most of the time we're using the same things to do, uh, to, to utilize both of those. ABS simply allows you to brake without wheel lockup. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to brake faster. Um, what ABS essentially does is it applies the brakes and unapplies the brakes at an insane rate. So we'll apply pressure until we get wheel lockup and then we let off and apply pressure and, and we keep going back and forth many, many, many times a second um, in order to keep this from happening. Now, why would you wanna do this? Skidding sometimes can actually get faster or, or get you to stop faster in some cases because we're also providing a friction. The problem with lockup or wheel lockup is we lose directional control. You can turn the steering wheel and your car is gonna plow right into whatever it is you're going into. With anti-lock braking, you are able to maintain directional control while you're braking. And that's what's important. That way you don't run into the person or the cone or uh, the car in front of you. And that's, that's really the big purpose of anti-lock braking. Um, we'll get into how this whole system works when you get into a brakes class. Um, because it uses a lot of solenoids, it uses a control module, it uses wheel speed sensors, and it compares wheel speed. If I see one wheel that's moving slower than the rest, I know that, that I've got wheel lockup on that one wheel, and then it will adjust my braking pressure on that one. What's nice is I can also use that as a double feature um, when I lose traction in my traction control systems to reduce slippage when you're possibly accelerating or turning. Um, so there's a lot of uses for anti-lock braking systems. It's standard, I wanna say it was 2008, ABS became standard on every car. Before that, it did used to be a, like a fancy feature. Um, not all vehicles had them. So um, that is our brakes lecture, um, I believe. Yep, we've hit the end there. So hopefully you had fun. Um, if you have any questions at all please send me a message send me an email um it's, i'm hearing crickets out there i see you guys are taking the test i'm i'm hoping that lecture is uh, because i'm hearing nothing maybe that means y'all are doing okay out there um i know this online platform is sort of tough um i didn't really get anybody from my last zoom meeting to ask any questions so i either did an amazing job on my lecture or y'all just don't want to talk to me <laughs> <laughs> but don't forget, Jasmine is still holding SI sessions. She's posting them in Canvas every single Monday and Wednesday. 
from 4.50 to 5.50, as well as the Friday session in the morning. So make sure uh, they're going over homework questions. So do your homework, go over the questions with them, and then, um, and, and then you can take your test. And, and you whiz right through your test and you'll know you'll have the right answers. So that's, that's the important thing is we want you to get the information and get it correctly um, rather than, than just throwing stuff out there. So anyways, I hope you guys are all doing well and um, that this video finds you well. And again, if any questions at all uh, or concerns for the semester, just uh, shoot me a, a message on Canvas, in the discussion board, on email, via Instagram DM, however works for you. Um, but until next time, I believe we're going to be getting into electrical. Woo! This is going to get crazy. Um, but uh, until then, have a wonderful uh, rest of your week, guys, and I will see you next week.